So we're super lucky today to have a double bill. It's very rare that we get both the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur in the room at the same time. So we have Mike Moritz, who is a legendary venture capitalist on his own, and one of his favorite entrepreneurs, Lisa Sugar, who runs Pop Sugar and all the brands associated with it. I know most of us women who spent a lot of time on it are excited to hear from her. Uh, I wanted to start today by asking a particular question inspired by Mike's book called Leading, which was published in September 2015. Uh, in your book, you say that uh, leaders know that success comes from making a few big decisions correctly rather than spending a lot of time being involved in many small decisions. So I wanted to ask both of you to introduce yourself and talk about some of the few really important decisions you've made in your life that have made you who you are. Oh, I get to go first? <laughs> well, unless, yeah, all right. <laughs> Never being bashful on these sorts of topics. Um, I'm happy to go first, Lisa. Uh, so uh, I think whether, whether you're running an organization or whether you're um, trying to wend your way through life, as you look back, there are only a few things that matter and I grew up in and I, I work at Sequoia Capital. I've worked at Sequoia for a, a very long time now. And uh, when I think of the things that mattered in my life, they're probably uh, professionally two decisions I've made that um, helped um, bring me to this classroom today. The first was deciding to emigrate from the United Kingdom and um, come into the US. And the second was being fortunate enough to be hired uh, at Sequoia um, in the early 80s. And everything else rippled out of those two. All, all the, if I had done neither of those things, none of the rest of uh, uh, my life would have worked out as it has. How did you make the first decision? Um, it was probably very, this uh, about leaving Britain, it was probably very similar just looking around the room at the decision that lots of people in this room made and certainly the decision made by uh, the gentleman who gave the money uh, to finance this center, Jensen Wong, uh, which is that there was far more opportunity mm. in America uh, than there was in our respective home countries. Mm. Mm. Very good. Very good. How about yourself? Hi, I'm Lisa Sugar. Um, I started Pop Sugar with my husband. Um, so that is one of my big life moments was actually finding the man I was going to spend the rest of my life with, who I then never thought I would actually work with, but starting the company with him. And um, I would say also moving to San Francisco because we are, were born and raised on the East Coast and that's in our blood. And so being now here over 15 <laughs> years, um, I wonder what, what life would have been like if we did not come here because um, I don't know if Pop Sugar would have ever existed. I think it was the opportunities that were obviously out here on the West Coast and, and seeing the entrepreneurial spirit and the opportunities out here to be able to start a media company on the West Coast uh, was because of where we were and that move. So knowing that you have a media background as a media buyer yes. and then you know, this yes. love of writing these articles that eventually became your passion, your company, and knowing that you have a journalism background as well, having written two books, uh, one on Steve Jobs, one on Leah uh, Iacocca, Three now, sorry, sorry, <laughs> three, and more hopefully. Um, was it love at first sight? That is a very sexist way of asking the question. <laughs> uh, um, uh, no, our, um, our, our decision about uh, Sequoia's decision to invest in Pop Sugar was uh, like every uh, important investment decision that we make where um, uh, at the beginning I think when we first met Lisa and Brian it was just two or three people and uh, so it was trying to imagine what would be possible if good things um, eventually happened and that's always a huge leap into the unknown and, uh, and um, a decision to get into business with founders who you don't know all that well at the beginning, but who you um, uh, hope and expect great things of. And we'd had some experience in these sorts of media-related businesses on the internet, and so that 
certainly helped uh, inform our judgment. Uh, but it, you know, it, it was it was a gradual process. It was it's not instant, but there was clearly at the time that uh, Lisa and Bryant started the company, an opportunity to create a um, new internet-based property that was tailored to um, uh, women sort of in the you know, 18 to 40 year old demographic. And uh, so that's what, and we thought there was a big opportunity there. And uh, so that's what led up to the decision. And yourself, you must have been looking for multiple different partners for your Series A. How did you decide upon Sequoia and Mike? Yeah, I, I think for me, maybe it more is a little more love at first sight. <laughs> I think, you know, knowing his track record and hearing wonderful things about people who have worked with him. Um, but the media thing was huge for me. I mean, this was, you know, my dream was to build a media company and uh, to know that Mike's background was in journalism and that, you know, he had you know, core attachment to that. And, and then just even coming from New York and where media is everything and the, the celebrities there are the editors and chiefs and the, you know, people who run the TV networks and knowing that Mike had, had known a lot of these people, it's, it was uh, something like, you know, I kind of looked up at that and so, so this is it, great. you were a first time entrepreneur when you were raising yeah. your Series A. Yes. My, now my husband was not. Yes, so he had, had... He was a serial <laughs> miscreant. <He's, laughs> he has uh, had some early successes, which was great. Um, so in the beginning, we really, we were just writing and, and building. And um, I started Pop Sugar on my couch. Uh, and I just felt there was a void in the marketplace for a really fun, female, friendly, uh, always updated, always needed something new. I was like addicted to writing really, really fast. And I knew that our audience was coming back often. So I wanted to give them new content constantly. Uh, so the more I saw the numbers going up, the more I kept writing. Mm -hmm. And it was Brian who had come from great companies like Kmart and J. Crew and Estee Lauder, and he saw how fast Pop Sugar was growing, and he said, "Okay, I'm quitting my my other job, and let's go, you know." But you started. But you started it, if memory yes. serves me right, just by um, as a hobby, uh, writing to your, yeah. your friends. I wanted to to get in the habit of writing every day because I loved media, I loved getting access to TV pilots for free and every magazine for free, but I really wanted to start getting my own opinion out there and started to write. Um, so it really was for fun for myself and to train myself. Mm. Um, and in the beginning, I wasn't even telling my friends I was really doing it. So when I was finding this whole audience coming to me and I knew it wasn't my core group of people that I knew who knew I was doing this, uh, it was very flattering to see how quickly it was growing. Mm. And it just fueled the fire for more. So you saw the market opportunity what did you see in Lisa and Brian? What character traits did you see in them that gave you the confidence to invest? Uh, what we see in uh, a lot of other, or other successful founders, which is a real uh, sense about the product or service in this case that they wanted to build and a real connection with, in this case, an audience, but uh, other times you'd say customers or, or, or con well, consumers. Um, and so that they had a uh, real sense and purpose. And they're able to explain, as, as Lisa just did, the sort of product that they wanted to build, why people would, uh, and why they were confident that there'd be lots of people that would care about it. I'm going to ask a slightly more pointed question. You read about finding the people who are obsessed. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you determine if somebody is, has a, an obsession? It's um, it, it, it's uh, it's it's a good point, and and it's one that you know I wrote about with with Sir Alex in, in this book, and I think it's um, a characteristic of the most successful entrepreneurs, which is that they um, certainly at the beginning of their company, and often for a very good long time, are able to shut out the rest of the world, mm. and just devote themselves to what they're really interested uh, in doing and shut off all the other distractions because there's really only one thing that they care about. And that care is deep and it's genuine and it's the sort of thing that they go to bed, um, uh, you know, go to sleep thinking about and they wake up in the morning um, uh, thinking about. Do you agree? I do. I, uh, our first tagline for Pop Sugar was insanely addictive. 
And uh, after some marketing team folks came in, they said, no one wants to be insane or addicted. <laughs> but we just felt it really worked. And I think it was you know, what fueled just to be able to write about all the other verticals, you know, to keep going and figure out what people wanted to hear from us about and what we weren't covering and you know, what, what we had in our site and vision from the beginning and you know, add new things that we added in along the way as well. So it's yeah. been 10 years. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. are celebrating your 10-year anniversary. <laughs> You've played many roles, from being a founder with two or three of you in a room, Series A, with uh, a lot of people now, and um, many, many more brands, and now you're the president of Pop Sugar. How have your roles changed over the years, and how have you maintained that flexibility, and how has Mike guided you through those transitions? Yeah, I think um, what I love about it so much is it has changed. I think actually getting away from the writing was the hardest for me personally, because I really enjoyed writing so much in the beginning, but once all the sites were launched and we were getting bigger and we were launching a sales team and you know marketing and getting out there, doing things like this, this is you know making sure that I get out and I'm not behind the scenes all the time, which I really like to do. I like the nitty gritty of deciding what the next show is that we're going to launch and who the talent is. Um, but that those are the new things. You know, video is something we didn't launch with, um, and adding video to the business and learning all about this, how the studios work and um, how to create content for various places that people are going to consume it, it changes, I mean, every year it's changing for us. Um, so it's the combination of wearing the different hats and, and working a lot with the different departments um, beyond just the edit team, which um, is really still where I spend a lot of my time. Um, it's still near and dear and the strategy that I want to spend a lot of time with growing that team and keeping the sites growing the way they have been growing. Mm. What so. have been some of the tough spots along the way yeah. in the past 10 years? Um, I would say uh, we were definitely slower to adapt to mobile. And I'd like to always say that probably every board meeting, Mike would pick up his phone and be like, what's next on this? And you know, we're like, oh, well, they're, just, they're already reading it on the, on the phone. But really being you know, a mobile first, mobile centric across the board. So whether the site is easy to read, whether we have a, a subscription box that's a monthly subscription box, whether you can purchase that really easily, mm. uh, all the integration into our shop style site and making it easy to shop from the phone, um, as well as the editors thinking about grabbing you with that headline you know, while you're running down you know, on your morning commute or going to get lunch or in the elevator getting all your news, you know, really, really adapting to thinking about mobile first, I think was probably the biggest. We were a little slower to that, but we're, we're now 70% of our audience comes from mobile, so we're figuring that out. And early on, um, building, we had a distribution partner early on in the company, a sales and distribution partner, and then making the decision, decision to build our own sales force, that was a tough and wrenching decision at the yeah. time. Why was it a tough and wrenching decision? Well, we were really excited about concentrating on the content uh, and yes, building the like audience, yeah. but then you want to have revenue, right? And we really wanted to be a profitable company, mm -hmm. and so we wanted to bring sales in-house, and that's, that's an expensive undertaking to build a sales team, mm -hmm. um, but one that has been wonderful for us, and we are profitable. So, have been for five years, so, yeah. <laughs> and, and how has Mike, what has your relationship been like? Because we, we oftentimes don't talk about, we celebrate when the round is raised and then we celebrate that. What, what has the relationship been like in the past 10 years along the way? It's, there, Mike is a wonderful It's the first partner. time we met yeah. in 10 years today, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, he's lying. We had a board meeting yesterday. That's why we're all actors. <laughs> um, no, it's been great. We have, uh, you know, lots of board meetings, um, but not too many, you know, and uh, Mike is always there in between any official meeting for advice that, that we need, helping, you know, helping uh, recruit talent, mm. um, you know, helping connect us to people that we want to work with, um, all, all wonderful ways. But to make no working. mistake about it, this is Brian and Lisa's company, <laughs> and, and they, they deserve 110% of the credit for this. He's, he's very supportive, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. So what's next? 10 um, years, what do the next 10 years look like? Well, I turned in a book today. So that, is a, that was a big project that I was very excited to be working on. And again, seeing how you know, Mike has been successful with his books and, and uh, talking to an audience of 18 to 34-year-old women and the needs that they come to us for. Uh, you know, we wanted to get a book out there to talk to them about a lot of the stuff that they, the advice that they want. Um, so when's that coming out? Uh, hopefully by September title? Uh, we're still working on it. 
<laughs> Send ideas to me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm aiming on work hard, play nice, nice, which is kind of our mantra. Um, and you know, basically how to power your happy. Power your happy is another theme we talk a lot about. Our content powers a lot of people's happy. Um, so kind of that how to how to find your route to living your best life and yeah, so the book is a big thing. Video is still really big for us. Um, so looking at other other places to have video distributed, creating scripted, going on Netflix, something down that route. We have another business called ShopStyle, which is an amazing search tool. If you guys are ever looking to buy anything specific, you go to it, you say, you know, black and white pumps, and I get every shoe from Saks, Nordstrom's, Forever 21, Neiman's, J. Crew, and then you know, you can get sale alerts. It's very, very easy to use. For, so. men, for, 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 men, yeah. men, for men and women. Men and women, women, yes, and children and furniture. <laughs> um, pretty much anything. So, <laughs> um, and we have, you know, excellent retail partners. Um, we send a lot of traffic to um, the Neiman's to targets of the world. Um, so building out that business and making it even easier for you because we all know we want, you know, the Instacarts and the Amazon Primes and that instant gratification. So making it even easier. And also our editors are writing stories all day long about, you know, what you need, you know, whether it's the latest gene or, uh, you know, some new hot trend that's happening. So that just to integrate it all in and make it seamless is our goal. Tell me a company that you really admire. Oh, that's good. Um, I love Disney. <laughs> um, Disney is one of those companies I just think going back to our mantra even of powering your happy it's there's a lot of overlap there and I think what they do whether it's the experience of actually being in the park or them creating content um, to merchandise they figured out lots of ways to make money and keep their keep, stay true to their vision and their mantra and their values and I think that that's a company that I look at that does a great job I love what you had to say about work hard and play nice how does that get implemented day to day? Like you're, you know, you're the founder, you're the president, you're the, the head of this company. You and Brian have run it, and how do you how do you make sure that that is lived out? In, in I mean, we're in stuff? it. We're in it with everyone. You know, we sit with everyone. Brian and Brian's favorite thing. You know, I would like to think it's a nice family vacation, but it's really like a hackathon. I mean, if you sent him away to just go and code, he's the happiest man. Um, so really, just being in it with everyone, and and you know, as we grow, we're you know 450 people now. Like really still trying really hard to have a company culture that feels like a family. When Mike walked through the door 10 years ago, uh, our daughter Katie was born like the first day. She came two weeks early, which was really the first day of training at our house with our founders. And I went into labor. And she came to the office with us for the first three years. And so that that whole family culture that we have and you know the fact that Brian and I are there together every day, uh, you know, we really try to have that feeling go through. But at the same time, you know, we are obsessed with this job and this company that we're building, so we are always on and working really hard, and we expect the same from our team. And finding people who are really passionate to join the team and be a part of it and help us grow. I also read that uh, Pop Sugar is 60% or more women? Is that 75% women. Oh, I'm sorry. We are, we are <laughs> a, lot, a lot of ladies, yes. Um, we're 75% women. Our exec staff is, we're 50-50. Uh, engineers are 30% women. Women have a longer time with us, or the tenure is longer with us. So yeah, a lot of girls. Poor Brian, we have three daughters, a female dog, and he gets to work with <laughs> because 75% women. So. so one of the reasons we changed our, our colors from pink to blue. But <laughs> What are your hopes and dreams for Pop Sugar in the next 10 years? Well, that it continues, uh, as Lisa said, doing uh, what it's doing. and. Uh, as it's done very steadily and predictably for a good long time, carving out uh, a larger position in um, the evolving landscape of um, media uh, focused at the, on the demographic that the company's long been um, dialed into. You've acquired a lot of companies in the last 10 years. Uh, how do you look for great companies to acquire to become part of your family? That's a good question. Brian is uh, definitely more, that's like a more fun project for him, mm -hmm. I would say, than myself. But it's, it's finding same things that Mike had mentioned earlier, finding people who are really obsessed about something, filling a need that we might have. Um, so whether it's great technology on the shop style end and finding engineers who are doing great things uh, from a, the shopping search capabilities to... Um, we bought a company called Circle of Moms years ago because you know our audience is really young, and we knew that the mom audience would have been 
is really great for sales. Um, and so bringing them in to our fold was it was a great uh, audience builder for us for moms. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, before I open up for questions uh, from the audience, uh, I have one more question for you. You have 500 students sitting in the audience. Think back to when you were in college, many, uh, many years ago, like me. I couldn't get credit for <laughs> just sitting through a leisurely <laughs> afternoon without a notepad, you know, checking out my Facebook feed. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, if you were sitting in the audience, mm -hmm. what would you tell your younger self, if you could go back to that time and give yourself a yeah. piece of advice. Three words. Or, what's that? Three words. Three words, all right. Follow your instincts, mm -hmm. okay. which is very, very easy to say and incredibly difficult to do. A little more context? Uh, everybody, when they're wondering about what they should do after college or after university, uh, you have the weight of expectations on your shoulders. You have college bills that you might have to pay. You have parents who have expectations for you in a particular uh, direction. And whether you like it or not, subconsciously, you carry all that stuff with you. And if you want to go in a different direction um, from what you've been spent your, the previous 20, 25 years of your life almost being programmed to go and do, that's a very difficult thing to do. How about you, Lisa? Um, I think for me, uh, it was more, it's more that it's just okay if you don't have it figured out yet. I mean, you know, when I left college, the internet barely started. Um, so the job that I would create for myself there's no way I would have known that that's what I was going to do. And I didn't know 100% what I wanted to do yet. So I think, I think really it's also, it's trying new things and just getting yourself out there and experimenting and figuring out what it is you're gravitating towards and, and liking and then follow that direction. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. Uh, do we have a mic? Is that how it works? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, speak loudly and clearly. Let's start with the front row. Uh, I have a question for Lisa. So I believe PopSugar um, wants people to be really engaged with the website. You want them to come back. You want them more. You want more people to coming back to your website, right? So internally, how do you figure out the user behavior? Like, how can you keep them more engaged? Yep. How do you internally figure out what's the mechanism? How do you figure that out? That twenty percent of my audience like this kind of uh, stuff. Thirty percent like this. How do you figure that out? I think uh, you know we, we definitely do a lot of deep dives on content. We're looking at what people are excited about when they come, but then even just engineering the page appropriately to have related stories um, and bubble up content around it that they would be interested in having never-ending galleries so they can go right into one story to the next. Um, we also have more of um, a, what we're calling a push uh, strategy this year as opposed to a pull. So a lot of us are you know getting a lot of our our audience to come to us through search and through social. So we're pulling them in, but now we want to push out to you. So, you know, email has been around forever and existed, but even just like push notifications. So getting more people to download our app so that we can, you know, give you news alerts throughout the day on your watch and your phone is something that we are constantly testing now, actually. I think uh, a more particular question yeah. would be, do you, guys, do you guys do big data analysis on the comments that users make on your website? Yes. On an article. So, yeah, so um, we, do, we the question. Uh, he wants to know if we do big data analysis. On the, on the comments. On the comments. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I would say each editor is looking at all aspects of their story and they will go in and look specifically at what people are reacting to and will follow trends. And we have lots of ways that we can look at that. Um, on the shop style side, we can definitely play more with the big data and what people are searching on and where they're clicking and go down that. Okay, so you manually like, actually do the big data analytics. So if I wrote an article, you manually go and check it, like what people are commenting, right? Something of that sort. Yes, okay. <laughs> if it's a story. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, question for uh, Mike. Uh, Sequoia aside, what's, what do you see the role of, uh, like, venture capitalists tweeting and posting on social media mm -hmm. and that connection to that activity to the firm's success? Uh, question is uh, the connection between a venture firm being active uh, on social media and its um, success. Um, it'll be 
quite a long time before anybody's going to be able to answer that question because social media as a marketing platform uh, is, uh, uh, is fairly recent in the grand scheme of things. And obviously Sequoia was around a long time before uh, um, the web came along and uh, social media and mobile uh, and everything else. Um, I, I think it's easy to get distracted uh, by uh, the sound of the trumpet and that what matters eventually is the um, quality of the investment um, decisions that are made um, and uh, uh, the acuity with, with which those are made. And it's somewhat similar to, to you know, the analogy that people used to make when uh, newspapers were uh, read more frequently than they are today, which is not to get sucked up into believing, um, believing your own headlines. And so I think, uh, um, especially in this sort of uh, today's era, um, humility also goes a long way, uh, particularly in a business as um, humbling uh, as the investment business or the venture business, which if you don't make the decisions correctly can uh, uh, hand you out a, a right royal spanking, uh, no matter uh, how uh, high your public profile. Um, let's do the one in the back, red shirt with uh, stripes. Uh, hi. Loudly. Hi. Um, my name is, is Matt Dory, and I was just obviously not a sophomore here at Stanford, um, but um, uh, I was intrigued that you that you had mentioned that you that D Disney's a company that you um, uh, admire. Um, our firm's had a, a thirty year relationship with Disney. Um, actually, Ann Sweeney, who is this? Who is the? I don't know if you know Ann or not. Uh, she's actually my daughter's uh, godmother. Um, if you like that introduction, uh, I'd, love, I'd love to meet with you afterward. And I'm sure I'm sure she'd love to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's do one more from the back. <laughs> the, wild cards. Um, the, the young man in the white shirt. You mentioned that uh, Popsicle is late to mobile, but it sounds, Michael, like you're pushing them to, to go there. Are there any innovations or trends you're seeing that you'd be pushing media companies to get on? Do you have a relative you can introduce me to? <laughs> 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 Well, one thing we talked about um, yesterday uh, when we all met uh, Pop Sugar is what we're doing to address this huge phenomenon um, uh, of, um, you know, um, um, Twitch game streamers. And there's a, a big, uh, you know, uh, that is not a masculine preserve. And so that's an audience and an activity that is enormous and growing. And um, I think Lisa and uh, the other editors agree that we could be doing, uh, doing more on that. So I think staying alert, just as, um, as the company's done over the last decade, and, uh, and not, um, um, you know, not getting blindsided by a new trend like this that just seemingly comes out of nowhere in, in the last 18 months. And, getting on it very quickly and just remaining. I, and the most important thing to do is to remain vigilant about these uh, new sorts of opportunities because it's easy um, to fall asleep at the, uh, at the wheel as they pop along. Cool. Please. Okay. Professor, uh, yes. I'm, I was saying, um, Michael, thank you for everything that you've done for the Valley since you came here. Um, I'll say no more than that. I met Michael the first time when he agreed to be interviewed for a case about Yahoo, um, accepting his uh, first round of capital, and then him um, dazzling Masayoshi San, who said, well, how, do you, how much do you think Yahoo is worth? And M Michael said, $500 million. And Masayoshi San was flabbergasted. I guess these days people say, $500 million? Is that all? But you have been guiding entrepreneurs for a long time, and I just want to thank you for that. Well, thanks, Tom. It's not me, it's Sequoia. I'm lucky enough to be part of Sequoia, so. But now, could I jump uh, to Lisa? Did you go to CES? I did not. 
Brian, my husband did. Who was riding? I went last year. Who was riding the Uber? Because there was somebody who looks like it might have been you riding the Uber. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 not Uber. Uh, Irby, Irby, sorry. The little electric scooter. Oh, it was definitely not me. <laughs> I was wondering, the, the general question is, um, when you were trying to think about what's happening, is CES interesting? Yes. How do you figure out what's most interesting? Because the article that you wrote is quite interesting. Yeah. So, um, so we have... <coughs> Editors, um, how do we think about CES when we go, and is it interesting to us? Um, CES is a consumer electronics show because not everybody knows that. Yes. Um, so the consumer, we have covered it from an editorial point of view. Uh, how do we look at the consumer electronics show? Is that something that's uh, important to Pop Sugar? And we look at it two ways. We send an editorial team who is covering the trends and the products that are there and how they would relate to women 18 to 40 and how we'll be excited about new things that are being introduced into our lives. Um, so, you know, female journalists there in a predominantly male uh, space. And then we also go from a corporate perspective where, I mean, it's now just a meeting ground where all CEOs and, you know, teams are meeting and talking about trends and doing panels and so on. So, um, you know, Brian and I sort of divide and conquer. A lot of times there are key things that we do go to together. Last year I did go with him, but this year I let him. I said, you, you go to see us this year. So he handled that. <laughs> see, uh, the, the lady with the red and black shirt. Uh, this question is, uh, I guess for, for both, but primarily for Lisa. Uh, what are some of the ways you navigated the challenge of running a profitable media company in the internet age when the mentality is that high quality content should really be free for everyone? Yes. Um, we are definitely, we, we like to still run like a startup, which I know is hard as we are as large as we are. Um, we have a wonderful CFO who actually attended the school um, and he likes to he's cautious and he wants us to be able to take risks and invest in stuff but there are times when we definitely have started a project and and realized this isn't for us we shouldn't go down this route anymore um, and let's just concentrate on the core which is you know the content and our great shopping tool and make it as you know wonderful as we can for our audience <coughs> try not to ruin the experience by taking too many ads you don't want to like ruin the experience for the reader on the side, yes, you. Uh, have you had any as a VC as an, as an, as an entrepreneur? Um, <coughs> what's in general, what, what has been the power dynamic between the two of you? And how could you resolve the emergency? Well, it's two against one, so there's never, I didn't never stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's been very amicable. Okay. Uh, let's go to the back. Um, the man in the light blue shirt. Hi, my name is Nicholas. Yeah, so I just have a question here. Do you believe that there will be another Steve Jobs that will happen in the next five to ten years? And why? <laughs> uh, no. Any more than I believe there'll be another Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. They're each very distinctive personalities. Now, if the question is, is there somebody that, whose name we don't know today, who 20 years from now will be very well known because of a company that he or she started? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Uh, so earlier, you guys talked about the big decisions that you've got, right? I'm just curious, could you tell us about a big decision that you think you got wrong? Big decision we got wrong. <laughs> well, I can think of investment decisions that we got wrong. Uh, too many to... Uh, uh, How about not? <laughs> as far as, like, I mean, when we started the sites, we had an original vision of 12 sites that we wanted to launch. And we realized shortly that there were certain verticals that weren't an everyday read. So I would say that there were certain things that we restructured um, to make the content packaged the right way. That's not really. <laughs> Actually, I'm curious, yeah. Mike, if you would talk about an investment decision that oh, I was went sideways, it's like Webvan. Or oh, thank you for bringing that up, Emily. <laughs> 
the two-syllable company that's going to haunt me. You know, <laughs> Webvan, we invested in this company, Webvan. And, um, <laughs> and so, uh, sometimes, you, you know, people, exactly. ask, yeah. people say, well, you know, what, what's going to happen in the end? I, say, I always tell people that I'm going to get cremated. And they say, why are you going to get cremated? <laughs> Because I said, I don't want to have a tombstone that reads, here lies the idiot who invested in Webvan. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, uh, fortunately, um, however, we, we got one thing right uh, in the Webvan investment um, 17, 18 years ago, which is the um, incredible, insatiable consumer demand for uh, um, uh, uh, delivery at home for groceries. And... Uh, fortunately have recovered from that and are now, many years later, very, very happy investors in a, a company called Instacart, uh, which serves uh, this area down here. And if you haven't tried it, you should because it's, uh, it's everything that Webvan wanted to be <laughs> and more. 17 years ago. And as Lisa, who is a very happy customer, said um, uh, softly just then, and far more because of the acuity of the founder, but also the advances in, in technology. But Webvan is the uh, investment that will always haunt me. <laughs> so when you say that not all dis bad decisions are bad, there's, there's a silver lining to, to <coughs> some of the bad decisions that were made. There's learnings. There are learnings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing worse to an investor's ear than this has been a learning experience. <laughs> because, <laughs> Because what that really means is this has been a really costly and expensive experience. Cool. <laughs> All right, in the orange shirt. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lawrence. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, Lisa, what do you think about uh, the new generation, Generation Z? Uh, and, and Mike, uh, what, uh, what, do you, what are your challenges? What do you think, uh, or what would you like to do better? Uh, well, I, I love the next generations. Um, I love hiring youth and studying them. I think that, uh, as users, huh? As users, I mean. As, yeah, I, I, um, I think it's fascinating. I think the idea that, you know, they consume a lot more, they share a lot more, they're just, you know, very fast, instant gratification, uh, relatability, personalization, all that stuff. A lot of that is a lot of the core of what Pop Sugar started with when we started um, and wanted to be, you know, a, in the know source that came across as a girlfriend and not in the know and or not you know, a know-it-all mm -hmm. so in the know but not a know-it-all and I think that that's how they want to be talked to and they want you know I love how diverse it is and how open people are to all shapes sizes colors everything it's it's great and I think that um you know it's only going to get better so we're totally embracing it and love it Excellent. Um, Red Stanford hoodie. Hey, thanks for the, for the talk here. Uh, to, to Michael, I'm wondering what, what would you say are the less obvious reasons why Sequoia is still the, at the top of the venture capital world? And by obvious, uh, may, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you would say team and network. <coughs> are, are there some other reasons that you see that, that keeps Sequoia up there? Well, that's a very nice um, question. Thank you. The question was, why do I uh, think Sequoia is um, uh, the preeminent venture firm. Um, uh, I don't. Um, I think. Uh, I think. <laughs> I always feel we're always one step away from going out of business, wow. and um, that we can never take anything for granted, and that we're only as good as our uh, next investment, and we can never be good enough. Wow. You have a lot of fans. Uh, second row. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, question. So a question came up earlier around what does the next 10 years look like? And how do you, what, what happens when a company, a, a wildly successful, profitable company, wants to remain private and independent? Um, but for a venture firm that has a, a 10 year life and has to return capital to its limited partners, mm -hmm. how do you think about you know, that next 10 years if, if you've been involved for already 10 mm -hmm. years? Mm -hmm. uh, the question was um, does a, a company like Pop Sugar, where we've been an in, investor for a long time, uh, does the uh, design of a 
10 or 12 year venture partnership mean that uh, we have to sell our shares. Fortunately, um, the investors in Sequoia, uh, entities that we call limited partners, um, they're very relaxed about it. And so if we feel that um, there are companies of which where we want to continue um, holding the shares inside the partnership, uh, they're very comfortable uh, permitting, allowing us to do that. And we've done that on a, on a number of occasions because I think all of us, the limited partners in Sequoia, realize that pressing for, quote, liquidity at inopportune times or when the future is, um, remains uh, looking very bright and there's no reason for the company to go public, it's not in anybody's interest. So it's not a big issue for us. Maroon shirt. Yes, you. Um, speaking of liquidity events, how do you see venture funding evolving with higher interest rates and market crashes like this week in the next two years? The uh, question was, what happens to venture funding when interest rates go up? If, uh, um, it's no accident that in the world of alternatives, it doesn't matter where you look, it can be the oil and gas industry, it can be the venture industry, it can be the real estate industry. The flood of capital into the private portion of those businesses since interest rates have come way down has risen because everybody, they're, they're, everybody's looking for returns on their investments. So as interest rates move up, uh, the capital will uh, retreat. And uh, if you're asking me when is that going to happen, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, obviously as interest rates go up and people feel that they can get reasonable returns with far less risk or perceived risk, um, then the, the, the money will retreat out of the private markets. Okay, I'm going to have three more questions. So uh, second row, yes. Hi. Um, so you've always advised um, college freshmen and pretty much everybody to follow their instincts, but do you think that's more of like an intuitive thing, or is it something that can actually be built up with experience or taking risks? Or the question was the uh, the advice um, I offered. I don't know whether it's good or bad. Um, that people should follow their instincts. Um, whether I could say a little bit more about that. Um, I think it helps if um, you try and enter an environment where you think you can learn a lot. And whether that's inside an organization, it doesn't have to be a company, it can be, a, be a, some other organization, um, or um, around people that you particularly admire, that you can learn a lot from. And um, I think that just helps expand one's horizons and uh, also gives um, the, the individual a sense of what excellence is really like if you pick the right setting or the right set of uh, individuals and done right, um, it's a transformative set of experiences and massively expands your horizons and the sense uh, that you have of all the wonderful array of opportunities that lie in front of you. I'm curious actually, Lisa, do you agree? I do. I think that, that yes, yeah, surround yourself with great people and try new things. I think absolutely. Front row in the purple. Thanks. Um, Sir Michael, what would Silicon Valley executives learn from Sir Alex and uh, what these sports owners or coaches learn from Silicon Valley? Um, so the question was about this book that I wrote recently with the uh, manager of Manchester United, Sir Alex Ferguson, and uh, <clears throat> what the lessons are that uh, uh, people in the Valley uh, could uh, take from um, the, uh, a figure who is the most successful um, uh, coach of a professional sports team in history. And, uh, and vice versa. And, and vice versa. And um, as, as I got to know him and as we were writing the book together, um, it struck me that um, the sort of attributes of leadership that um, 
he has demonstrated for so long are very, very similar to um, the attributes that you see uh, among the very best company founders in Silicon Valley. And it was also pretty apparent to me, and this may sound too bland for everybody, I wish there was a bigger surprise, that um, the characteristics of leadership is embodied in an individual. Whether you're running a soccer club in the north of England in the rain, or a technology company in Cupertino in the sunshine, um, are very, very similar. Um, there are some differences, obviously, I think uh, hiring people in, in his uh, pursuit is, is uh, or retaining people in his pursuit is a lot easier than it is in, in Silicon Valley. His business, the business of soccer, is a much slower business, moving business than um, the world of technology. So there are some differences. But I sent the book to, there's a very, very famous, he's one of my heroes, called... Uh, he was an early uh, 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 the leader, one of the leaders of the first generation of venture capitalists who invested in Apple and and Intel, and he was the fir you know first investors in in in, uh, in the early investors in both of those companies. A gentleman called Arthur Rock, and he's in his 80s now. And he, he wrote me a very sweet note last week, and he said, "I just finished the book, and I would hire." Sir Alex Ferguson to run any company in which I was an investor. <laughs> Very cool. All right, last question. Um, in the white. Perhaps a bit too specific a question, but based on your experience, uh, how realistic do you think for a startup to be able to do B2C and B2B at the same time? And this is an early stage startup. Uh, how realistic is it for a company to do B2C and B2B uh, at the same time? Um, uh, we, I, I'm sure there are examples of companies that have pulled it off. Um, I just think right at the beginning, you have to concentrate on doing one thing super well. And once you've done that, uh, the second thing becomes becomes easier, particularly if you're dealing with, it's one thing to sell precisely the same product to both audiences. Um, and if you can do that, bless your heart, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. But I think it's very, if you've got to tailor the product differently, I think that's a very dangerous thing for a company to do uh, right at the start. Um, you know, it's no coincidence, obviously, that <coughs> Apple under, under Steve, jobs was not prepared to compromise, change and alter its products um, to please corporations. They would um, build products and if corporations wanted to buy them, so be it. But they weren't going to come up with, with special products and it was, uh, it was an approach that uh, obviously served them, served them very well. And then as you know, there are plenty of examples of other companies that have over time uh, succeeded in uh, with two different sorts of distribution channels. Plenty of examples of that. But at the beginning, I think simplicity is a virtue. All right, we're totally out of time. And clearly there are more questions. So feel free to come on up afterwards if you want to speak to the two of them separately. And we'll see you next week.